Time. You're watching Today I Grew Up. To infinity and beyond! Hey, howdy, hey, partners. It's Today I Grew Up, and we're back for a very special video podcast special. We have the very amazing Kat Cressida. She is a Disney legend that I call her. I think she's got a, a wealth of history that we'd love to dive into. Anything she'd love to share. She's just done amazing. Like you've seen my video, I was sharing a little bit of what she does as far as uh, voice acting and doing a lot of characters for not only video games and like shorts and toys and things like that. I'm really excited to get into her story and uh, yeah, let's just meet her and get right into it. So Kat, thank you so much for being here. Definitely check out my IMDb if you want to see like what video games that I've done recently, because those they're, they're pretty up on the credits. So a couple of big titles that dropped this year, God of War Ragnarok is one of the hugest titles that's released ever. And that um, is a video game title and that's out and Horizons West. I'm very honored to be a part of as well. Um, that's for the video gamers, as well as a lot of Marvel games and um, and Disney games for which I've done Jesse for multiple uh, titles currently running. I know that that your audience, your core audience is collectors and toys and nostalgia. But for anybody who's willing to just take take one step outside of that. I'm honored to be the voice of a number of animation characters, including Dee Dee from Dexter's Laboratory, um, which has her own toy now. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and oh. I mean, she's got a lot of toys, I know, but but the Funko Pops definitely have a very, very devoted following. <laughs> Besides voicing Jesse, I'm also the Haunted Mansion Bride, which has a number of collectibles, some of which I've just voiced again <laughs> for anybody who's into Disney or the Disney parks. So I'm honored to be the voice of Constance Hatchaway, as well as a lot of her facial reference. And uh, a bunch of stuff for a lot of Disney cartoons and non-Disney cartoons, Solar Opposites, which is uh, created by the same people who did Rick and Morty. And that's been running solid for a few seasons. That's what I've been up to in the recent past that have released that I can talk about. And then um, anybody who follows me on any of my social media, particularly Instagram and Twitter, I drop these amazing collaborations with the Disney archives. So if you're into Disney history, Imagineering, or any of the toys they created, like the audio animatronics, I'm very honored to release very rare footage that's been lost. We re-edit it, clean it up together, make a little story and drop it every day. You know, I have a, a mad following for that stuff, if any, if any of you are into that. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's it's really cool for my audience to get to know you, like you said, venture outside of what I usually offer here on this platform. And that's why I like to do these uh, video podcasts because they're kind of a new thing for me to kind of just get into the mind of somebody who's in this field to just kind of explore, you know, the possibilities and just like you're living the dream that most people can only dream of <laughs> living. I mean, it's just like, it's incredible to hear your credits and what you've accomplished. It's just, it's very inspiring. And that's what I do here on those platforms. I try to inspire people um, by hearing other people's stories and we inspire each other. And it's so cool to hear just how much you've accomplished already. And, you know, you're, you're just in the middle of it. I mean, you have so much more, you know, to offer us, I'm sure. And we're just here going to consume it. And it's so great. Um, <laughs> as soon as I booked you, I bought this shirt immediately. I got this Jesse shirt. Adorable. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you so much because like I was like, oh, I need a Jesse shirt with just her head on it. That'd be cool. <laughs> um, but but anyways, I, I, I tried on before the podcast, I was trying on a few different shirts. I've got one with like a giant Mickey Mouse from the old school Mickey Mouse Club logo. I've got the old school Mickey Mouse sweatshirt that they sold at the parks with the classic Mickey pose. But on me on camera, it just looks silly. And it's like you just end up staring at the chest. Okay. So. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I guess I have to start with this question because it's it was the one when I asked uh, my fans, what what question would you want to ask Kat? And uh, the very first question that kept popping up was, you know, how did you get the role of Jesse? That's what a lot of my fans want to know. How did you get the role? Sure. Um, well, there's a very special department at Disney, at Disney Studios called Disney Character Voices. And they are the gatekeepers and the vault keepers of not only all of the original voice cast. So any celebrity or voice talent who's created a character, originated a character's voice, they book them for all the, what we call ancillary product. Ancillary product is the term for anything and everything that isn't the animated feature. So it could be a ride at the parks, a parade, a nice show, a toy, a video game, sometimes an animated short or a little promo. 
it can be basically anything that's not the original animated feature or or its sequels. And they basically will, you know, reach out and book the talent for anything that comes up. And anybody who knows the Disney brand knows they're always coming up with other ways to spin out their amazing extensions of the animated features and the animated movies and not animated movies. They also are responsible for finding the voice matches for all of the characters because inevitably, especially as they continue to book celebrities in these major roles, inevitably those celebrities will be busy doing another project, shooting a live action TV series or movie or just living their life and being parents or, or whatever comes up for them. So they need to have backups and they're called voice matches. Celebrity voice matching is a stepchild to impersonations. And it is in in many ways far more difficult because the gist of it is not to be funny or humorous or exaggerate the character so that you get it immediately. It's more about exactly matching the voice to do an audio illusion, as I call it, and trick the ear into believing that that's the original voice. And I'm honored to do a, a number of celebrity voice matches for a whole bunch of celebrities, including, of course, wonderful Joan Cusack. The way that that works is that they hold auditions, sometimes way in advance of when they're going to need it, maybe as soon as that they know that a movie's coming out in six months for Disney or Pixar. They will start looking for the voice match so that when it comes up, it's there. And oftentimes we get used also to do ADR for movies which or TV shows, which is dropping in and voice replacing certain lines if maybe a plane flew overhead and they need to, you know, in post-production, fill that line back in, or they change the line slightly and they will imperceptibly edit it so that you can't tell that they just changed that word. It comes up a lot. It's really fascinating. It's a whole like hidden part of the industry. I got into voice matching very early on in my career, probably as an extension, believe it or not, to having grown up in the Disney parks and wanting to imitate the voices I heard because they were phenomenal, as well as listening to those read-alongs and hearing all the voices from the, you know, back in my day, they were records and they were like, when Tinkerbell rings her little bell, turn the page. And you would hear clips from the original animated features and I would impersonate those too. In fact, weird story. I don't know if this is gonna be interesting to your people who, or not, but if you're into Disney parks, I was a cast member. I was honored to work as a Disneyland cast member. And I had to drive the five freeway in Los Angeles every day, twice a day. That was two plus hours in the car. So I would listen to, and I'm going to age myself, cassettes mm -hmm. <laughs> of these read-alongs. And there was nothing better to do, but imitate Wendy from Peter Pan or Mrs. Darling or, you know, Perdita or Anita from Dalmatian. So I, I spent a lot of time practicing that. And interestingly enough, it had a place. And Jesse came around. There was another amazing actress who was already designated to be her voice match. They knew that there were probably, Joan at the time was, I think, shooting at least two or three live action movies a year. She's, you know, at the height of her fame, you know, Adam's family and uh, just a number of, of things. So they knew they were going to need a voice match. Another actress had already booked it. And sadly, that actress passed away. Mm -hmm. um, very young, very young. I was honored to have been brought in initially as sort of a, hey, let's see how versatile you are. And I'd done a number of Disney characters for this demo reel for Disney character voices. At the time, they would do that when they were slower. And I had laid down Wendy from Peter Pan and just a number of them. And Jesse was one of them that I'd thrown in because I loved Joan's voice. I thought it was fascinating. And that's what they, you know, they turned to basically when they had to quickly find a, a replacement. And I went in for a callback. They threw yodeling at me and singing, which I was not prepared to do. Luckily, some inspiration kicked in and I somehow managed to sound like I was singing as Joan would sing potentially, and do some of her yodeling and yeehaws and all of that, and was very honored to book it. The first thing I did was Woody's Roundup, which was a live show at Disneyland. I think in, I want to say 19, 1999, they came out there. Yeah, that was around Toy Story 2 era, so that would make sense. Yeah, yeah I think that's, it, it played in the Golden Horseshoe, 
it was um the show that was oh i did see that yeah i've seen that yeah yeah Yeah, so that was there's actually a whole the whole show was recorded a beautiful version of it that you can actually still see if you google it on youtube so i got to voice for that and that was the beginning of it that's so amazing and incredible thank you so much for sharing that it's just it's so cool to hear you know from from you and it's just i it's so crazy like you know, going into something like that and not even like getting thrown things and you're able to like kind of pivot and be like, well, let's just do this. And you just go for it, which is so cool. And (laughs) and it worked out for you, which is amazing. And and so I guess that was the next question I wanted to ask was like, what was the initial like rehearsal or screening for that? Like, were you given a few days to rehearse before the audition or was the auditioning process just that nerve wracking or was it just natural for you? Or I just love to hear more about that. It It came in, they want to see you tomorrow afternoon. So wow. <laughs> I brushed up on it, but, um, but it, it happened very suddenly. I mean, fortunately I, I had already been working on her for the past several months on and off on my own practicing. Luckily when the time came, I mean, to me, it wasn't a sure thing at all. Joan of all the voice matches I'm honored to do. And I voice match for Julia Roberts and Scarlett Johansson and Charlize Theron. And I mean, pretty much almost every a-list celebrity over the age of 35 up until it like maybe age 60 i've voice matched at one point or another and younger ones too as they as they come along you never know at the time that you walk into the studio it's never a given that you're going to hit the mark there's so many other factors that could come in you'd like to think that all that rehearsing would pay off but nerves adrenaline sound systems sound setup chemistry of who's in the room. I mean, all of it can affect just like any, any acting audition, any callback. Back in the day, again, we were off of cassettes and CD CDs. I was burning CD samples and putting it into a CD Walkman and listening to it, you know, in between every take, just to keep refreshing my brain as to all the isms in Joan's voice. To do a voice match properly, to, to really nail it, there's so many things in a voice that affect how it ultimately sounds from the mouth formation, what the actor does with their tongue, lips, if they have an accent, if they speak out of one side of the you know mouth or the other, their tone, their pitch, their pace. I mean, there are so many elements that go into it. It's kind of scientific at the end of the day. You're breaking oh. down all oh, of these yeah. elements and then hopefully putting them back together yourself having pulled them apart and figuring out what they are and then rehearsing and rehearsing and trying to keep getting closer and closer and closer to the sound of the actor. It's hard enough to match a line that you already have a reference for. So, you know, one of Joan's lines from, from the original movie was serving as my, my jumping off point, my reference point. First, you've got to match those, of course, to, to nail exactly what she already did. But then the hard part is they take away anything, you know, and they give you brand new lines. And that's the real trick. That's the test. If you can maintain sounding like that actor on a completely fresh script that you haven't ever seen before and never heard the uh, actor doing before. Thank you so much for sharing about voice matching. This is going to be new for me, not only to the audience, but myself. It's been great to hear from you and just hear like everything that goes into this. It's just, it's so incredible to hear because it's, it's something that, you know, I, it's just some, so new to me and I really love learning about this area. So that's why I'm so happy that you're on here sharing this with us, not only to educate me about voice acting, but those watching this. So I really appreciate you just sharing how difficult that is because voice matching is sounds pretty difficult in, in my perception from what you've spoken about here. Kind of segue over uh, yeah. something I thought about during our conversation that I wanted to hit on was there's sometimes I feel a physicality, maybe possibly aspect to voice acting, because when I watch things or I hear things, a lot of times I hear maybe a voice actor be out of breath or maybe extra dramatic. And it makes me wonder, is there physical prep to this? Is there things that you do such as maybe diaphragm exercises, maybe running around before you approach the mic because this happens to be a very, you know, maybe you're hyperventilating or you have to be out of breath. I I love to hear about it. Honestly, we are acting. I mean, just because it's called voice acting doesn't mean that that's all that's getting activated. For it to be believable, you have to fully be acting. The face all the way down to the feet, just as if you were doing on camera. And even more so, because all you have is the voice to 
bring the character to life. So you have to put even more behind the voice to bring it to life. If you were to watch a live action scene, a great live action scene, one of your favorites, but then you were to close your eyes and not have the visuals, it, it could potentially be rather dull because you don't have the eyes, the editing, the, the visuals going on that are helping to create that moment. So we have to put more so behind the voice. So yes, absolutely, we do full on physicality. There's no way to not, if you're invested in the character, if you're doing a monster, you're gonna be doing crazy things with your body and your hands and, and everything to support that character voice. And if you're running, absolutely. I mean, if it says, you know, chasing or fighting or jumping or whatever, yes, those are called exertions or effort sounds. And we absolutely, you have to do them. Otherwise it wouldn't be believable that that the person was running. And to do that, then you physically have to be <laughs> doing whatever it takes to get that sound out, whether it's jumping in place or jump roping right before or running in place, we do it all. And then the trick is not to whack the mic while you're doing it, which happens quite often during auditions or accidentally popping the mic, air pop sounds that then you have to go back and redo what you just did. So yes, to all of your amazing questions, we do all of it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And it, it's so cool to for people to learn that as well, that like you said, it's, it's not just voice acting, you are acting, you know? And just because we don't physically see you flailing your arms or like you said, you know, maybe, you know, almost whacking the mic, you know, I'm sure you're jumping in place sometimes. It's just so incredible to hear that, it, you know, if anything, it's it's the same as acting. It's just, we don't see that. We just see the animation, right? Or we're seeing something, another visual to pair that audio with, which to me sounds so realistic sometimes. I've always respected the art because when I hear what I'm hearing is just so believable sometimes that you almost forget that there's a detachment between the visual and the voice acting in my mind, you know, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, and it's the, you said that beautifully. That's That's exactly right. And on top of it, I mean, one of the first lessons I, I learned in my very first class in voice acting, and I I went into it so cocky, so convinced that I was going to be great at it. Why? Because I'd spent years training in acting. I'd spent years doing Shakespeare, training for the stage. I'd spent years doing musical comedy. I felt like I'd hit all aspects of acting. And therefore, just being in front of a microphone was going to be a cinch because I didn't have to worry about my face or my hair or my clothes. You know, I just had to worry about my voice. I couldn't have been more wrong. I sucked. And a big part of that is because it's a completely different set of muscles that you're using to do voice acting. The analogy that I use, which isn't quite perfect, but just because you're an all-star football player, great athlete with all, you know, everything in the body at its top peak and able to perform at the absolute top of that particular craft doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to hit a home run because you haven't trained for that particular aspect of sports. Just because it's mm -hmm. sports doesn't mean that you're great at all sports. Just because you're a great actor for the stage doesn't mean that you're a great voice actor yet <laughs> without proper training, right? reworking it. So. Yeah. And it almost you saying that also reminds me of like the psychological impact of this, because it's kind of like you there's just so much to the table you have to bring, which is, you know, the psychological aspect for me, which I always love to investigate is you almost have to kind of like you're, you become the character like any actor. But then there's a psychological impact too, be where you have to think about you know, where's my emotional intelligence or state at in this situation, personality wise, right? That's another aspect of psychology. Right. For those, of, for those of you not as sophisticated as our wonderful host about, <laughs> Thanks. He's, he's using very, very deep intellectual terms for it. It's sort of like you're by yourself having to do a scene and respond to somebody else, but you're doing it instead of in real acting where you've got an actual actor to, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio or fill in the blank, Tom Hanks of who you might be acting across. You're in the booth by yourself. So you're having to use emotional intelligence to fill in all the blanks to figure out what's going on in the scene. It's a lot. It's not impossible to figure out, but it does take a lot of practice. I was a therapist for 10 years. I worked with um, ages three to 55 in mental health crisis. I worked with kids and adults. And so for me, the psychology was always a big thing. You know, I'm always curious why people tick, why people do what they do. And this is going to segue to the next point. Why do you do what you do? And I kind of want to hear kind of maybe uh, something you can share 
as a mission statement or or what what puts your love into voice acting to continue to do it? Well, the short answer is because I'm nuts and <laughs> just crazy enough to do it. I, when I go to speak at colleges, which um, prior to COVID, I would go around to all of the UC system schools in, in California, UCLA, UC Santa Clarita, UC Berkeley, which is where I graduated from, UC San Diego. I would talk to the graduating class, the graduating film students and theater students, both grad and undergrad, and literally say to them, if you can think of anything else that you would like doing for a living, doesn't have to be love, just have to like it enough to want to commit to it for a good measure of your life to make a living at, to actually support yourself, do it. Because that saying, that cliche that, you know, nobody promised you life was going to be easy, which so many of us forget in America every day. We somehow think we miss the memo that it's supposed to be difficult and we get upset or frustrated or angry when it doesn't go our way as if we were entitled to a smooth life. It's a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times more so that in, in the entertainment industry, because you have so little control over any of it, unless you are super rich and you fund all your own projects and produce all your own projects, you're going to have to give up a great deal of control, no matter what level you're at, whether you're a writer, director, producer, actor, sound and editor, sound engineer, whatever part of the entertainment industry you decide to land in, so much else controls the outcome and whether or not you have success in what you have pursued. You have so little control over the outcome, at least in, and forgive me, I don't mean to marginalize any career because every career is difficult if you're going to do it well, from being a doctor, to being a lawyer, to being an accountant, to being, you know, a host at an upscale five-star, to being a chef, to being a server, they all require skills and they all require practice of those skills to become exceptional enough at them to make a decent living, right? That's mm -hmm. the point of it, I guess, is to make a decent living rather than a hobby that you pursue out of love and joy. So if it's going to be your vocation, your career, so many other people will have a say in that, whether or not you even make it to the finish line of making any money at it in entertainment. Whereas if you go into accounting, for example, or become a CPA, my grandfather was a CPA. Was he the best CPA ever to exist in America? I doubt it. Was he good? Yes. Was he good enough to have lots of clients throughout his lifetime and make a very decent living? Yes. He had a lot of control in that. He got proper education. Then he set up, a, you know, set out a shingle, set up shop. Clients just naturally would find their way to him because everybody needs a CPA if you're going to file for taxes correctly in this day and age. Um, maybe not a CPA, maybe just an accountant or help filing. You know, you go to somebody to help you. Unless you're a genius on the computer, most people will at some point or another need an accountant. He was good enough to have a consistent living throughout his life and then retire comfortably and, you know, live a good life. He had some amount of say in that. You could be the most talented actor in the world, have put in years of training, be, be cute enough to be acceptable on screen or talented enough to be decent at the microphone and luck would have you just never booking. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong agency, wrong order of them listening to the auditions. The person wasn't in the mood to hear your voice that day. Whatever it is, it will affect the outcome of as to whether or not you're making a successful living at it. So it's far more difficult. I only know from the acting and the agenting side, I was an agent before that. At least it's an agent. It was more like an attorney's job, a publicist's job. You, were, you weren't the talent. You weren't the commodity. You were the person selling the commodity. So you had a lot more say. And whether or not this client was succeeding or that client was succeeding, you still were making a good salary. And, you know, as long as you had a decent enough roster, if that makes any sense, that you just had to have enough clients to, to make a decent living. But once you go on the talent side, whether you're the writer, the producer, the director, the actor, those are all talent, very talented people. You may not make a living at it. So to answer your question in a very long-winded way, I'm nuts enough that I wanted to take the risk and that's what it is. It's a huge gamble unless you're lucky enough to be born into, you know, Ron Howard's family or Steven Spielberg's family or Tom Hanks's family, where you're going to get at least a good 
you know, push of nepotism to at least get you in the door and get you a start. Even, even then though, those people, they may get their first breaks, two or three breaks because of their association and, and the name and the power behind their family. But to make a living at it, they're going to have to be good enough. They're going to have to do it on their own eventually, whether or not they got that first break. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for answering that. I, I think this is exactly what I wanted to hear um, because I'm nuts like you. I, I'm one of those people who take those risks. Um, I had a very good career. I, I went to college. I got my bachelor's and master's degree. I did what people expected from me to do. Go to college, get a job do well at your profession. As I started climbing the ranks in my my profession, they, they wanted to make me a suit, a corporate, basically corporate guy who's chasing people on a spreadsheet, uh, pie charts, um, funding, billing. It came, became about contracts. And I realized that wasn't me. And I had to follow my heart, my passions. And I realized if I'm smart enough to make it in this industry, I can make it in under other industries. So taking that risk was huge. And I, I quit my job in 2020 and became a full-time YouTuber. This is my third year um, self-employed. And I've also continued be becoming a musician as a pop punk musician, because that was always a thing I did. And now I'm touring Japan and I'm signed to a record label out there. And there's so many people that support me online to continue what I do here on YouTube as a platform. And all I want to do is I tell people, it's not about fame. It's not about money for me. It's about inspiring you to follow your dreams and chase your dreams and do what you feel you're meant to do, which is going to be different for everyone. And like you said, not everyone's going to make it. I agree with that. I don't think everyone can make it. But if you're doing something you love and you can get compensated for that, then to me, that is living the dream. Whether people know you or not, you know, for me is is not the goal end goal. So thank you for sharing so much about you know, where, where your headspace is at in, in pursuing this, because it's so inspiring to hear it. And it makes me not feel alone. And like, I'm not the only crazy person who takes that risk and jumps to do something they're passionate about, you know, they answer the question as to why, why I do do it. Um, besides being crazy, it's because I fell in love with it very early on. And anybody who is a true actor, uh, like in their soul, it's something that hits you at some age and it's something that you feel inclined to do most people do it for a yearning to communicate they may not know that that's what's in their heart that's burning to get out but they want some way to express and communicate what they're feeling in a way that just living a regular life and not acting doesn't allow them to express that and the difference between i guess somebody who be moves on to become a professional talent versus somebody who does it maybe as a hobby for joy or never pursues their dream or maybe, and, and this can happen, maybe they have, they drive, but not necessarily know how to translate it into a marketable talent commodity. You just have to recognize if that's hit you and it can't be, it's never about becoming famous. I suppose there's probably some people who have made it where that was their drive but they lucked out that they had the looks and the talent to go along with that yearning to become famous. Mm -hmm. But it, for most actors, it's for me as a young child, I remember being four and reading stories out loud from books and it just wasn't enough. I needed to express what was going on. It was bigger than me. It felt like it was bigger than me, not my talent, trust me, but that drive to communicate in a way that was emotional felt large enough to want to push for that and then got lucky that at least I had parents that were willing to tolerate me going to rehearsals but I had to make a deal with the devil in my family um it wasn't enough to be driven to do it and love it I had to get good grades and get a great education that was the the deal that I had to make my entire young life was yes I get to go to rehearsals if I get a straight A average wow that's, that's my family that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's great too, you know, and, and that was something my parents, I was blessed enough to have good parents who pushed me to, to always say, Hey, look, we know you want to be a rock star and do the whole music thing, but you know, get your, finish your college education, you know, have that career. And they're right because I, there's just so many things I learned working in that field. And I think any field you, you try and apply for and work for, you do learn, you know, discipline and, and I'm sure relating to your story, 
of, you know, trying to get those straight A's and, and working hard in school, it's going to, it's going to help, you know, shape your discipline for when you have to approach like it your career as voice, act, as voice acting. This is such a great point. Again, very boring for toy collectors who just want to talk about <laughs> toys. Sorry. Uh, no, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to the toys right now, but no, I love this. But yeah. That's a very good point. Superheroes. Somebody uh, asked me on a panel did I notice the, the the trend that most of our superheroes in American movies, American franchises of superheroes, because of course the move, all of these Avengers and Sony and DC, they're all produced in America. They're American productions for the most part. Why is it that so many British actors were being cast as our iconic American superheroes? Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I, you know, kind of, Yes, I certainly had known that these were all British actors. It was the first time my brain went, oh, they're right. Like 85% of the actors who were taking over the major roles were British or Australian or New Zealand or Irish or Scottish. And if you look at it, some of us don't even know it because they've done such a good job of hiding it with their you know, training, mm -hmm. uh, speech training. But the reason is to play a superhero, a comic book character, and make it interesting enough on any level that grabs you more than just, God, they're good looking, or God, they really look the part. You need to believe them to get emotionally invested. You have to care about Batman to care about the rest of the 190 minutes of the movie, or else you're going to fall asleep and you know there's not going to be a franchise. Let's just put it that way. So the actors who were trained in stagecraft, in Shakespeare, in supporting themselves on the stage, that's where actors in the UK and Australia and New Zealand and Ireland, Scotland, that's how they are forced to start. No one gets to just jump into an on-camera class or become a model and then go into acting in those countries. You get laughed out of the room by any agent. You have to have trained on a stage. That's where they all mostly started. Some of them squeezed by by making it onto a TV series first from modeling or from just lucking out. But most of them, 98% of them trained on the stage and had to break down scripts the old fashioned way and learn emotional acting. And that's why they carry those skill sets to then put on the Superman suit. You know, even though they're against a green screen, maybe not acting with anybody real in the room and having to have us believe those moments that we see mirrored on their face. Even the ones who aren't maybe the greatest actors in the world, we still buy into. By that, I mean, you know, compared to a Meryl Streep or a, an Al Pacino or Robert De Niro, you know, the, the right. bar, fine American acting. They still really hold their own in those ludicrous suits, in those crazy outfits where they can buy into it enough so that we buy into it. Christian Bale, Henry Cavill, Tom Holland, you know, go down, go down the list of people who've done those crazy suits in the recent past and villains. And they usually have a dialect that they're now turning into American. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. Cause that, that really, to, to wrap that all up, cause that was a lot, it, it was great to hear how we connected to the, you know, the psychological impacts of, you know, our actions and what we do, how that impacts us psychologically and also the discipline aspect. And it comes back to like this full circle thing with this actors. And the reason why the British actors, you know, get these parts is because they're trained to do this British emotional acting. Right? Or other, other than American, let's just put it that way. Other than American. Yeah. Other than American. It makes sense, you know, why maybe these roles are, are, are taken because there's so much discipline and work put into these. Not things. about the superficial for them too. Oh, of course. Yeah. And, and that's another problem that we have here in this country. And I 100% agree. But going back to the toys, I want to get back into, because this is another question my fans really want to know, what was it like doing at voice acting for a toy session versus uh, maybe something else that's not toy related? Is there a difference? Is it kind of the same thing? And I would love to hear that process. Like you're coming in to voice a toy, basically, or a sound chip for a toy. We often aren't told what we're voicing for. We sign these NDAs, and especially if it's a company like Disney, um, they're very secret about what our session's for. So we don't even know. Obviously, if I'm coming in to do Joan Cusack's voice for Disney, I know I'm doing Jesse. So that secret's out of the bag. But believe it or not, for video games, oftentimes 
they give us a, a fake name for the game. We have no idea what the actual game is called. For example, when I first recorded Gotham, Arkham Gotham uh, video games back about eight, nine years ago, it was called Metallica. That was their code name for it so that nobody would know what the title was. You can figure it out once you're in the recording session based on things you're saying. Like if if I said out loud, you know, here in Gotham, okay, well now I know I'm in the Batman universe. But they do try to trick us. They do try to make sure we don't necessarily know what universe we're in, what title we're voicing for, or the name of our character, which can be super confusing if you're doing a famous character that you would have liked as an actor to have known who you're voicing. It would have been nice to know I voiced Wonder Woman for X, Y, or Z. But they purposefully don't want us to know because they don't want any leaks. So then you're just really relying on you know, you're, you're acting, being true to what they've given you. Long story short, I don't know if I'm going in for Disney to do a toy or a video game or a show or a parade. So there that's, is no, to me. Um, that's so interesting. And no, continue. Yeah. It's just, I'm just kind of mind blown by that, but it makes sense in a way because leaks are a huge risk for, for them. I'm sure in many ways. You no, know, I just did a bunch of stuff as Constance Hatchaway, the bride. And that was an interesting there is a story there because that was the first time I was being asked to voice that character outside of the context of the ride. It, so if anybody's familiar with this character in the Haunted Mansion, she's in the attic. It's a beautiful, they've done a beautiful set piece of several weddings happening over several years mm. and the leftovers, the, the, you know, sort of um, haunted leftovers of these various weddings, because of course, what did she do on all of her wedding nights? She often, <laughs> that husband and then moved on to courting, you know, being wooed by the next. In the context of that ride, I'm a character that you literally just see at the end of the attic doing a loop of haunted, spooky, sexy wedding vows with a twist, with an evil twist on them. And that's the context. And you know, I'm basically like storytelling what you're seeing in the ride. I'm giving it context and letting you know who the character is. And then we're having fun with the fact that she's a bride who doesn't let her grooms enjoy the honeymoon. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's great. I mean, I've been on that ride you know, most of my life. So it's it's so cool that, you know, I'm speaking with you that you actually voice that <laughs> character. So it's yeah. And it's it's very believable because when you're there and experiencing that ride, you feel it's real. Like you're so immersed in that world. And that's what I've always loved about Disney rides in general. Yeah, the so. imagine you're doing a great job. But where I'm going with that is I'd only ever delivered the lines in that context in the attraction, understanding what the context was for the attraction. Now take the bride out of that attic and now put her in something. Let's just maybe it's a toy, maybe it's a video game, maybe it's an animated short, but now I'm having to actually speak real lines, like co communication dialogue lines versus just wedding vows. I was mind blown. I was like, and I create, I originated that character. I wasn't even doing a voice match, but I didn't know what to do. Mm. Like, how do I, <clears throat> how do I do Constance Hatchaway saying something other than wedding vows for any Disney fan out there? You, probably having that moment of, yeah, <laughs> how do you do that? Because she had a certain cadence to those wedding vows and they were literally just these catchphrases. And now I had to actually talk to a human being or another character. For that context, for that story, I had to figure out fast how to translate that. And it wasn't easy. And I still don't even know. I mean, they were happy, but I left the recording session going, Man, I wish I'd known that what we were doing. I wish I'd had a chance to practice. Yeah. No, when totally. <laughs> ahead of time because they're so confidential. To answer your question about what is it like to do a toy, all I can tell you is in retrospect, they were fun sessions, but I didn't necessarily know we were doing a toy. There was one, I take that back. There was one thing that was like a clock or teaching kids time. And obviously it was going to be a toy from the way that the, the lines were. Because it was Jesse saying things like, you know, yeehaw, now the, now the little hand is pointing to the, <laughs> what time is it, partners? And, you know, I'm not doing her full on voice. But I remember in that session going, well, clearly we're doing a teaching toy <laughs> about how to tell the time. Awesome. So <laughs> it was obvious. 
No, thank you so much for sharing. Because again, this is a this is so much learning for me and for my audience. Uh, just kind of like, you know, you you could be doing a toy or you could be doing you know whatever it is, and you don't know you're doing it, <laughs> which speaks to your incredible talent and your ability to just jump into a recording yeah. session and just do your thing. And guess what? Like you told us, you're like Disney loved what I did, <laughs> so obviously you're doing it right because they love your work and you keep getting called back, which is uh, for more, which is great. You know, super cool. That's sweet, but I want to fill in one blank. It's not oh, sure. That- talented and I don't want anybody walking away thinking that they don't have the talent to try it it's more it's that standing at the edge of the diving board when you're kind of scared of diving into water which I always was I there was always a discomfort to me of hitting the water I remember that viscerally as a kid some people love it right they just love jumping off the diving board into it I was the kid who would be like oh what if something doesn't go right? What if I hit the bottom of the pool? I was neurotic. It's that feeling. Anything that happens in acting where they ask you to do something that was not rehearsed or that you weren't given the chance to prepare for, it's that scary, nervous feeling of, do I take the jump? Do I take that leap? And that cliche of a leap of faith, that's that's kind of giving it a magical spin. It's more just, no, you just got to take that leap. <laughs> the rock. I mean, you don't know what's going to hit you on the other side. You just have to make that leap. And sometimes I succeed at it gracefully. Sometimes I manage to surprise myself. And after taking that leap into doing whatever, it had a good result that everybody was happy with. And sometimes you take that leap more often than not, especially on auditions. And it's just a thud. I mean, it is not good or pretty or elegant or worth anybody having seen or heard. (laughs) <laughs> other than you getting that awful read out of the way that's a saying that at the beginning of voiceover training they used to say was you've got a thousand horrible reads in you let's get through them so you can get on to the good ones right. which can give you the comfort zone at the beginning of the class that everybody was going to suck and everybody was going to be flailing and not sure what they were going to sound like or if it was going to even be worth listening to And by taking that approach to it, you kind of go, okay, that's sort of the nice way of saying you got to keep working on it and rehearsing it because you're not supposed to be brilliant immediately. It's very comforting to know that you're not supposed to be brilliant at the beginning of anything. In fact, it would be a miracle if you were good, (laughs) let alone great. Yeah, it's crazy. I I love that you said that because it, it relates to my story as well. Because people always ask me, how are you so successful with this? And how do you do this? And how are you doing all these things? And I tell them, I wasn't always good. (laughs) You know, my first music when I started writing songs were not good. You know, when I first started YouTube, I wasn't good either. You know, just kind of like it was a discipline. It was doing my best. And there's no perfection. I don't believe in in perfection. I just believe in good enough that you're doing your best to your ability. And that's the best we can do because I don't believe that anybody's perfect. You know, we're not robots. You know what I mean? We can't just click a button and we're going to be perfect every time, you know, so, but we can definitely get good at our craft and what we do. And, and you're certainly a a remarkable talent. I've heard your work and I'm very humbled. And I I thank you again for being like, just, you know, talking to us about this because it's just so cool to hear that other side, you know, you're, you're that window into the other side of that world that is just, it's such an awesome art and it's another form of art. And it's just, you know, because acting to me is art, you know, in any form. So I appreciate you sharing that. And one more question relating kind of to like, we were talking about Joan uh, Cusick and everything. Have you ever met Joan at all? I just, we're, a lot of the fans were asking, like, have you ever met her? Has she heard your work? Have you ever heard any feedback from her at all or anything? No, although it's definitely, I mean, it's a fear of mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to say thank God in all the years I've been honored to to try to to match her tremendous talent and wow, what a great character she created with Pixar. I always worry that she's going to hear something and be like, who is that chick trying to represent me? So if she has, she's been very gracious in not (laughs) calling out that was less than awesome. I think that they're all aware that there's voice matches because they get an offer. You know, their agents have to present them, if they're good agents, present them with an offer. Hey, there's this project that Disney has. They have this budget for it. They can pay you this for it. And, you know, the celebrities have the option to pass on it or to accept it. And if she passes on it, then she she must know in the back of her mind that 
clearly they've gotten somebody else. Some actors actually have the power and the ability to say that they get approval on their voice match. I think Disney's gotten taken that away because that just becomes too much time and energy and, mm. and less maybe the actors aren't even the best judge subjectively as to who's matching them the best. Johnny Depp initially had that in his clause for Jack Sparrow. Which, by the way, it was a character that I was very honored to train and coach the actor who took that that role over. Wow, He's that's amazing. <laughs> now, uh, spent hours and hours in my booth here in my studio working with him to get closer. And it's been an honor to to match her. And no, I've never met her. I met John once in passing. Okay, wow. Her brother. Um, and I had a huge, I've always had a huge crush on him and everyone <laughs> done. So I I remember thinking in the parking lot when they, when they introduced us in passing and it was like, literally like a, oh, John, this is Kat. She's da, 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 da. And I think he barely acknowledged me. <laughs> I wish I'd said in the moment, oh, I voice match your sister. I wish I'd thought to yeah. say that. I was so smitten that I didn't even think to say that to what he probably wouldn't have cared. He'd probably been like, that's nice. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been cool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've met celebrities too. I mean, other celebrities before. And it's this surreal thing where it's like, I know you're a normal human, but to us, it's just like that starstruck, like you get frozen. You're like, I don't know what to say. So what was it like? I know you were a cast member uh, previously at Disneyland. I want to hear what was it like being a cast member back when Disneyland was more awesome? As you had said, <laughs> I'd love to hear. I'll show this so everybody can laugh. Whoa, cool. That's awesome. I'm testing your Disneyland IQ. Oh, yeah. That's that's not Casey Jr., is it? Or No, like but very close. Version? It's the story of Sam in a Boat. Oh, it's a storybook. Storybook land boats. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. My first voiceover job. because we That's had awesome. Telling stories. That was a golden time. That was, there's very few experiences in life that supersede our fantasy of what it might be like to do something. And, and that's for reals. Like even voiceover is not a magical existence. I can tell you it is not a magical existence, especially these days. There's so much tech that we have to learn and support ourselves with. And for those of us who are not tech heads, it, it takes away a lot of the spontaneity that we used to have of just walking into a booth. Being a cast member during that golden age at Disneyland, this was in the early 90s was when I was a cast member right out of college. And it was, it was like summer camp from your favorite movie meets the coolest, sexiest, most awesome interaction with other cast members who share this crazy passion. We were all young. We were all attractive, you know, reasonably attractive because we were forced to be because you had to look good, you know, for the public. You had to have good hygiene and smell good and... <laughs> you know, be well-groomed, I guess is the best way to put it, which they still maintain. You know, you're representing this show, this Disney image. And we had a freedom back then that they don't have anymore for cast members. We were, it was a blast. You had to follow your script. We all had scripts for our stories and our attractions. They were called stories. They were attractions, not rides. You had your costume and you had certain things that you could say and couldn't say and you had a Disney answer for everything that a guest could could ask you. So you definitely had a script you were sticking to. But it was incredible. So much fun, especially if you loved the park. There were people who worked at the park who didn't love Disney or, or the parks the way I did. My one regret is that back then they were still in this very, dare I say, chauvinistic um old school mentality of, you know, girls, females did certain attractions, males did other attractions. So there were some crossover in some of them, but for example, men did not work storybook land back then. That mm. was for the cute little cheerleaders in our little culottes wearing our little fancy land outfits. Nice. And we would tell stories because, you know, back in the nineties, females told stories, Jungle Cruise, which one of my friends got, you know, got booked as a cast member for, they got to be the sarcastic hunters with mm. the gun being snide and sarcastic and telling jokes. Females couldn't be funny back then, apparently. Wow. So, um, I was madly jealous. And my fantasy, by the way, if anybody has the power to make it happen is to one day go back to Disneyland and get to be a skipper on the jungle cruise just once. Cause I am very sarcastic. I would rip that one a new <laughs> one and I would be awesome. And I know how to shoot. But um, 
That's fine. I have a friend, um, a family friend named Megan, and she was a skipper on. Just, so, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. she she loved it and she enjoyed every aspect. Like you were saying, it's she had a lot of fun and we had fun supporting her and trying to catch her boat, you know, when she came around. Yeah. <laughs> so it was fun. Yeah, so that, it's good that, that females it. are doing it now. That's great that they changed it. <laughs> but it, I, I had a blast. There was backstage where we would have our breaks. We'd have our little break areas. And I fell in love with somebody on the All American College Band. He was the saxophonist. He was sexy. His name was Jeff. Nice. Jeff is out there. Yeah, if you're if you're watching this, <laughs> it's for you. <laughs> he's not. But um, but we had a summer romance, and it was you. You would get to basically clock out and. Then, and go back, you know, in your street clothes and enjoy the park. Yeah. The and, for, and for those who get it, Disney is not just a park. Like you were saying, it's cool that they called it attractions, you know, um, and not just rides. Right. And it's to me, Disney is it's so much more personal than that. You know, it's it's somewhere I grew up going to with my family, with friends. And it's an experience that you just never forget. It's almost like the more we go, even as adults, like I just wish I lived there because you just want to be there all the time uh, just to surround yourself with the magic and the fantasy of what could be in our, you know, creativeness. And maybe this, and you don't have to be a really creative person to enjoy, you know, a place like this. Uh, I definitely get inspired all the time. And I, it was my dream to to work with Disney in some capacity. And I'm happy to say I have worked with Disney and Pixar and some PR uh, situations. So that's been really neat. Like you, I've signed NDAs too, and there's not much I can share right now either, but it's been really fun. And to just touch that magic and be a little bit a part of it and anything I could do to be part of that, to inspire people, just, it, it gives me the chills even now. So talking about it. So, and even talking to you, a Disney legend in your own right. This is kind of the last point I'd love to touch on because it's, it's very important for my audience. What would you tell somebody maybe who might want to get into voice acting or any kind of creative outlet uh, like this, what what advice would you give to them um, approaching this if they're new to this? You have to have the training and, and there's no way around that, unfortunately. Even if you were lucky enough to have the nepotism gene and somebody you knew could get you a lucky break, which is hard enough these days. I mean, they really have to push hard because if you're not good, doesn't matter who your dad is or who your mom is. They're not going to put you in their project. Even if you get lucky and have a lucky break, you still have to have the training to support the opportunity. So, I mean, to me, it's it's just, it, it's obvious. You have to, like any career uh, or any hobby that you want to succeed at, you have to get the training and you have to have a lot of it. And then once you have the training, then you have to have the constant rehearsal practice, exercising that those muscles over and over and over again and doing it for free. For some reason, voiceover seems to be a one of the careers that people make an assumption. All I need to do is buy, you know, set up a home studio, get a microphone and boom, I'm in. And there are the, all those free platforms where you can do something from home, but you're competing against people who have a lot of training. So even then, even if you could just set up a home studio, you still have to have the training and find, you know, studios to train at. Thank things. you for sharing that because it, it really goes back to the reality of things that anybody could jump on camera or microphone, but it doesn't mean, you know, that's success <laughs> or, or you've made it, you know, <laughs> like it's not overnight, you know, there's no, mic, you know, and unfortunately in this generation, sometimes it feels like people are the microwave mindset where it's like, if it's not done in a minute, then, you know, it's not worth trying or whatever. But like you said, I, you have to do things for free. You have to do things just to learn and experience. And so, Thank you for sharing your experience with us. It's been so humbling and I've learned so much from you today and my audience I'm sure has learned a great deal and just like I have. And thank you so much again for being on this podcast today and just sharing everything, your storytelling, you know, the, the difficulties, the ins and outs of what you do. It's a very respected profession and it's so cool to hear about it. So is there anything you'd like to promote or share with our audience uh, how we can find you? I would love it if you guys, you know, join me on Twitter. It's just my name at Kat Cressida, at Kat Cressida, Instagram at Kat Cressida, Facebook, it's Cat.Cressida. <laughs> a lot of Disney magic, a lot of behind the scenes on voiceover and a lot of the cool events that I've got coming up, the signings for all the toys and the magical collectibles. And thank you so much. It's been such a joy to be on this amazing podcast. Thank, thank you, you so much, Kat. And we'll see you next time. And thank you, everybody. Take care. You want the real buzz like you? You're a, uh, you're an action figure. You are a sad, 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 strange little man. You are a sad, 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 strange little man. You are.
are a child's plaything. Hey, Ham, look, I'm Picasso. I don't get it.